which is on the mobilization of the Mapuche in Argentina, of the Mapuche peoples in Argentina. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include that uh, in, my, in, in, my, in my talk today. Um, but I wanted, to do, I, I wanted to go a little beyond my specific area of, of, of research, um, because I've been writing about Mapuche and, and thinking about the Mapuche and doing the field work on the Mapuche for the last three years. But I wanted to go back to my initial engagement with the literature uh, and the news on indigenous peoples in Latin America in general. So my my plan for today is to go over those four points, which seems a lot, but I'm gonna give you I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, Fairly, fairly quick. How much time do I have? Uh, about an hour and a half. Oh, I'm not taking all that. It's, 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 it's going to destroy your brains. Um, if you don't mind, just uh, when, when, when I hit the mark of 40 minutes, let me know. And I'll try to see how far I am. I'll, I'll start trying to wrap it up. Again, uh, I don't know how long it, what I prepare will take. But uh, I, I'm more interested in throw in some of the major ideas connected to the topic and then see what kind of questions you, you may have and, um, and so on and so forth. So, um, according to estimates, this is just to give you a little idea of, of, of the importance of indigenous peoples in Latin America. According to some estimates, between uh, 34 million and 40 million people in Latin America, or between 8 to 10 percent of the population can be classified as indigenous. This includes isolated hunter-gatherers in the Amazonian region, the rural and urban Quechua and Aymara populations of the Andes, as well as indigenous peoples from Mexico that migrate to the U.S. for seasonal jobs or permanent jobs. But what, what constitutes an indigenous people? How can we define what indigenous peoples mean? This is a very long, but it's, it's probably one of the, of, of, of the most used definitions of what indigenous peoples are. Indigenous peoples, nations, and communities are those which, having a historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territories, or parts of them, um, that develop on, t uh, on their territory, sorry, consider themselves distinct from other sectors of the society now prevailing in those territories or part of them. They form at present non-dominant sectors of society and are determined to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations not only their ancestral territories and their ethnic identity, but also the basics of their existence as people as peoples in accordance with their own cultural patterns, social institutions, and legal system. So there is a lot to consider, but the key there, after all those very worthy definitions, is that the, the latest recognition for the definition of indigenous people has to do with whether they define themselves as such. It's a self-definition. We're not, states are moving away from using indicators, let's say, to establish, to establish which citizens are now indigenous. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that uh, the re-emergence of indigenous movements throughout Latin America took place since the 1980s. Movements, however, built on previous experiences of popular struggle. So they're not, that's why I, I, I like to talk about the re-emergence. This is not the first time that indigenous peoples, let's say, go to the streets or demand change in the political arena of uh, Latin American countries. They've done before, but under the umbrella of different social demands. 
Indigenous movements, secondly, transformed the political landscape of Latin American countries that witnessed this reemergence. This is a case of Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, countries of the southern cone, like Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Paraguay. In Ecuador, for example, the indigenous movement has been central to almost every anti-neoliberal protest from 1990 to this day, and it is among the most successful indigenous movement in Latin America. As a result, then, indigenous movements facilitated the emergence of the Indian as a new political actor. But why new? Because indigenous peoples, this time, enter politics in their own right as Indians. Every time I use Indian, Indians, Aboriginal, so on and so forth, it's always with quotation marks. Some, some, some indigenous peoples use that terminology to define themselves. In some other communities, that's a derogatory term. So I'm not going to get into all those struggles for how we name uh, indigenous peoples now. We can talk about that, of course, later. So they are new. This time, they enter politics in their own right. This reemergence of indigenous movements in the region is facilitated in the context of an expanding framework of international treaties and the recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples, which include, for example, the right to retain their customs, institutions, and customary law. So here, there's a bunch of uh, declarations within the UN, the International Labor Organization, and so on and so forth. So the new phase of indigenous activism then has therefore two outcomes, and this is going to be the main focus of my presentation today. The first is defining terms of the impact that these new political actors have in the existing pol political arena of, of Latin America. In this case, I'm going to argue that indigenous movements pose a direct challenge to, the, to three main features of Latin American politics. First, the character of its limited democracy. Second, the direction of its socio-economic structuring policies in the form of neoliberalism. And finally, a challenge to the notion of a homogeneous national state. The second outcome, however, relates to an emerging paradox related to this, to this last challenge I mentioned, the challenge to the state. And here I, I argue that while well, indigenous movements can be seen as part of an emerging challenge to liberal notions of democracy, neoliberalism, and the state, they're also a sign of the restructuration of the state in Latin America along the lines of neoliberalism. In other words, what I'm saying is the first impression is that they're challenging neoliberal policies but the second outcome is that, and this is going to be the, the focus of the last section of the presentation, is that the, the, the state throughout Latin America is changing. And it's not changing only in terms of the policies. It's changing about its expectations of what Latin American citizens should do and should be able to do in the new states. And here, I am not making a distinction whether we are in talking about countries of the pink tide of, of leftist governments or if we're talking about the, the sort of the, the more conservative politics of uh, current Mexico or Chile. Here, I'm not making that distinction yet. So, how did indigenous movements reemerge? Well, there are basically three factors that can explain, in general, uh, the reemergence of indigenous peoples. The first one is the pre-existing organi organizational networks. For those who are familiar with the social movements literature, wink to my social movement students, um, movements in this case have been able to build on previous experiences of popular struggle. The struggle of peasants, of left guerrillas, of unions. All those kind of struggles provided the language and the networks necessary for indigenous peoples to re-emerge as political actors. Of course, the expansion of educational coverage during previous decades facilitated also the development of new indigenous organizations. The approach of indigenismo, the, the policies of, of, the sec, uh, of the late, of the second half of the, of the 20th century, the idea of assimilating the Indian 
to the to, to the national context. Making, for example, uh, a Mayan a Mexican citizen. That's what I mean by by indigenismo. The idea that 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 we as a state should take the, the, the cultural features of the citizen so that citizen doesn't longer um, identify himself or herself as a Mayan but as a Mexican first. Mayan perhaps in the second in the second place. The second factor that contributed to the reemergence of, of indigenous peoples is the political li uh, liberalization. In other words, the redemocratization. As you know, uh, most countries throughout Latin America went to a series of bloody dictatorships and civil wars. Um, in, for the most part, in the in the early 80s, mid 80s, uh, the trend um, emerged towards the um, uh, democratization. This, of course, provided new opportunities for mobilization. The commemoration of the Quinto Centenario, the 500 year anniversary of either the encounter of civilizations as the, as the governments call it at the time, or the 500 years of resistance anniversary as indigenous peoples organizations viewed it, strongly boosted the organizational process at the, at the continental level. So it is in 1992, basically, that indigenous peoples indigenous organizations across the continent started to connect each other to commemorate the anniversary of, 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 the, um, of the beginning of the conquest of, of, of the Americas. The third element, I don't know why I have to be, I don't know if it's gonna work otherwise. Uh, the third factor is, of course, the implementation of neoliberal state reforms. Neoliberal policies left Indians politically marginalized as individual citizens. It disempowered them as corporatist peasant actors and confronted with a challenge to autonomy. In other words, the disappearance or the weakening of existing forms of access to the state and resources and subsidies make many indigenous communities organize themselves now according to ideas of Indianness and not longer as peasants. In the state, before these reforms, the state was basically giving access to resources. You can think of any kind of resources the state can provide to its citizens. It was basically channeled through peasant organizations. When these policies, basically, when these welfare programs disappeared, indigenous people found themselves without, without any of these uh, channels through which to reach uh, the state, state resources. These factors, however, these three that I mentioned, do not say much, though, unfortunately, about the kind of challenge that indigenous peoples pose for the conception of politics throughout Latin America. I said that my second point was going to actually explain what I believe is the major impact on the political arena of Latin America, politics. So I basically gave you the three factors that may explain why, in general, indigenous movements emerge. But I haven't really, they don't say much about the kind of impact that we are talking about. This is what I would like to do that now. 